In part 1 of my case study on Horizon Zero Dawn, Guerrilla Games 2017 PlayStation 4 exclusive, I explored how the game is built to create herds of AI-controlled machine animals. This requires a complex agent hierarchy system where each machine can make decisions about how to behave using a hierarchical task network planner, but also groups agents together to dictate their roles and responsibilities as part of a herd. This is all part of a system known as the Collective, which maintains the ecosystem of all machines in the world as you're playing it. I'm Tommy Thompson and welcome back to AI in Games. In this closing part of my analysis of the AI in Horizon Zero Dawn, we're going to look more closely at the systems that each individual machine can utilise as part of their core behaviour. This includes the likes of sensor systems, navigation for both land and air machines, and how execution of AI behaviour is heavily tied into the animation systems to give each machine an unsettling and realistic behaviour. So first up, let's take a look at the sensors used by machines to trigger AI responses as well as how animation ties into the overall execution of their behaviour. There are a significant number of unique sensors that a machine can use. Visual sensors such as the watcher's eye to radar and proximity sensors on long legs, oral sensors that can hear a range of sounds, such as explosions at a distance, to stone throws close by, as well as the ability to sense players colliding with them directly, and in some cases, a sense of smell. Each machine has a collection of these sensors with each calibrated to have their own sensitivity values, making it easier to sneak up on say a watcher or grazer, but a lot more challenging to catch a stalker unawares. Now a traditional sensor system might just enable for events to occur around an AI and they either see it, hear it, or nothing. But the sensor systems are actually a lot more nuanced, and this is achieved through information packets that are attached to the objects that can cause a variety of stimulus in one of the machine's sensors. These information packets can be attached to things such as the player, other human NPCs, rocks, fired arrows, other machines and wildlife. The data in the information packet tells the receiver, the machine that sends something, information about what it is that it detected and its state. Hence machines, as well as human NPCs, can tell the difference between a dead body lying in front of it and an arrow that whizzed past their head and missed them. But it also helps ensure that things such as the player hiding in long grass or behind trees cannot be spotted. Each AI character, machine and human alike, can handle and interpret sensory data in a different way, so certain information might be ignored by some characters, whereas others react to it promptly. In fact, depending on the strength of a sensor in a given machine can actually reduce the data from the packet that can be read. This helps manage the emergent properties of the game, such that each character type responds to information in their own unique way. Now should an AI make a decision based on the sensory data, we've still got to make sure it looks realistic. So when a machine has decided to make any action, such as moving to a new location, investigating a disturbance or attacking the player, there is still the issue of animating it during execution such that it looks as realistic as possible. The animation of these machines is a big challenge, given that they need to be able to look like their animal inspirations, but also have a distinct machine-like behaviour at times. This requires both the navigation and combat systems to pay attention to the distance the machine is going to traverse, and the animation tool chain then adjusts root bones of animations and warps them to suit based on the perceived distance and time left. This ensures that regardless of how far the machine is moving and how fast it's doing so, it can start the animation, move into the main part of the behaviour, and then blend it correctly at the right time. This is important for things such as running to points, but it's even more relevant in combat. Many of the animations used for attacks have two distinct sequences. There's the wind-up, which telegraphs the attack to the player, followed by the big finish, where the damage is dealt. Horizon Zero Dawn uses a similar method to that discussed in my video on the AI of Doom 2016, where the system controls the current locomotion of the machine, blends movement or attack animations to suit its specific points, and then ensures that the machine lands or stops in the right place at the end. Now there's still one big issue I haven't yet talked about, and that's navigation. Ensuring these machines can wander around the environment is a real challenge, given this large variety of unique enemy types are all different sizes and shapes. So they need to be able to move through terrain in a way that makes sense for them. But also, they need to be able to recognise changes in local geometry and adapt to that, or simply ignore it depending on their type. Now, as I detailed in a recent AI 101 episode, this requires a commonly used AI tool known as a navigation mesh, 
and nav mesh stores information about how a given character can move across the map based on what are perceived to be obstacles in the world. While you can calculate it at runtime, they're often built or baked before the game is released and loaded into memory when necessary. However, given Horizon Zero Dawn has such a large map and only specific segments of it are relevant at a given point in time, since the AI are only active and moving around if they're near you, the navigation mesh is built at runtime, but only around the immediate region of the player. But the thing is, there isn't just one nav mesh, there's six of them. Four of them cater for character movement based on the size of the object – small, medium, large and extra large. Hence humans can move around in the small mesh alongside watchers, while the likes of the Thunderjaw has a nav mesh pretty much all to itself. Plus, there are two extra nav meshes – one for swimming machines such as the Snap Maw, as well as a unique mesh that ensures machines stand in good locations should the player be trying to mount them. In each case, obstacles can block or alter a navigation mesh's structure and the system recomputes changes in real time such that moving obstacles, and even other machines, can impact the ability to move around the space. What's interesting about this is that obstacles have differing properties and can either prove to be completely impassable or simply undesirable to walk across, but much of that is dependent on the state of the machine's AI behaviour. As mentioned in part 1, machine patrols actively avoid stealth vegetation when generated, but when investigating local disturbances, while grass is still considered undesirable, it will walk through it if necessary. The same principle actually applies to large rocks and trees. These are impassable obstacles, except for larger machines such as behemoths, rock breakers and thunder jaws. These beasts can smash rocks apart and uproot trees, but only if they're in an angered state or giving chase to the player. Outside of that behaviour, they'll treat them just like any other obstacle. While this navigation tool chain caters to land-based machines of all shapes and sizes, it doesn't work at all for those that are based in the air. Non-player characters that move through the air not only have to be aware of the nearby obstacles on the ground such that they don't crash into trees or cliff faces, but they also need to be wary of the elevation of nearby geometry. The world of Horizon Zero Dawn is full of rolling hills, forests, rock outcrops and steep mountain climbs. For the two flying machine types, the Glinthawk and the Stormbird, they need to know how to navigate the air such that they can take off, fly a patrol route, land and also swoop down and attack the player when necessary. To achieve this, the game not only has the nav mesh system on land, but a completely separate navigation system in the air. This proved to be a challenge for the AI team on the game, but they found a really creative solution. The technique used is known as hierarchical path planning over mip maps. Mip mapping is a technique actually used in computer graphics that aims to minimise the memory overhead of a texture or images by providing a collection of the same image, gradually lowering in resolution. It's typically used for managing level of detail in games, so that objects hundreds of metres away can be visible, but use less texture memory than those directly in front of the player where you need to be able to see them in the highest quality possible. This approach was considered given that when a machine is flying a path around the world, it doesn't need to know with complete accuracy the local geometry of where it will be a minute from now, but it really needs to know the lay of the land immediately around it, should it decide to land. The path planning system for aerial machines uses mip mapping for the height map of local geometry, a data structure that tells us the elevation of a given XY position of the world, with four levels as they move down from top to bottom becoming increasingly more complicated and realistic. Level 3 is the simple and abstract model, while map level 0 is a pretty accurate height map of the in-game world. Much like the navigation mesh, the mip maps are built at runtime when needed, given a machine doesn't need to know the entire world's elevation data when flying within a fixed region. When they need to fly to a location, the flying navigation AI starts by using the A-star search algorithm over the highest level of mip map. Hence it calculates the simplest version of its flight path against a very rough model of the geometry. The A-star makes flying up and over obstacles more expensive than flying around them, hence you'll see machines glide around mountains and cliff tops more often than fly over them. Each time it calls the A-star algorithm, it only has a fixed number of iterations. So once the path is completed on the simplest mip map, up in level 3, it will then take a given segment of the path it calculated and refine it by burrowing down to mip map levels 1 and 0 to make it more realistic and respect the geometry more accurately. Plus, it then smooths the path out such that it removes steep slopes or sharp turns in order to make it feel more natural. The system works really well given that any flying machine that is in the air always has a flight plan. Even when most of it is rubbish and quite crude, 
and then it can boil it down to something more practical by repeatedly calling the search algorithm to refine the path to become more and more realistic. It's also quite memory efficient, but it does have one caveat, in that given it's based on the maximum height of a given region of the map, they cannot fly under bridges or rock outcrops, but much of the time as a player, you won't really notice it. Between the land-based nav mesh and the air-based mip maps, flying machines can then coordinate how to attack, land, dive attack and even crash in a way that respects the geometry. Machines that are hovering above the player while attacking are still using the pre-calculated flight plan, only it's not necessarily moving directly forward along that path and plays the corresponding hover animation. The velocity of the machine is tied to whether it's flying, gliding or hovering, and as such they can circle you in the air in a realistic fashion, all the while still using the same navigation tool. Takeoffs and landings use a separate system that communicates between the flight navigation and ground-based navigation mesh. It searches for a valid position on the nav mesh it can land on, typically points that are slightly higher off the ground than the local average, and then adjusts angles and velocity accordingly. Once it's landed, it's now using the corresponding nav mesh based upon the machine's size. The same principle actually applies to when they crash too, except this time, the only valid landing positions are based on the machine's current heading, and while it might look less graceful, it's fundamentally using the same tools. The specifically programmed edge case for this is the Stormbirds dive attack. Stormbirds will circle the player, then come crashing down towards you at your current position. It's using the same systems, but in a much more dramatic fashion. However, one added caveat is when circling the player, the Stormbird will often wait until it can block out the sun or moon before making the attack. You might have noticed this when playing the game yourself, and it is intentional. During testing of the Stormbird AI, the QA team noticed that it would periodically block the sun based on where you were standing, and this made the attack all the more disorienting as the light shifted and blinded you during the dive. At that time, it was purely accidental, but afterwards, the AI team went out their way to ensure it does it more frequently and deliberately. Horizon Zero Dawn delivers an experience unlike anything seen before, as a world teeming with mechanical life plays host to the tales of Aloy and the mysteries of our past. The AI and gameplay systems of the machines are critical in building this apocalyptic future for players to explore. As we've seen over the past two videos, this was a tremendous effort by a team of around 10 people through several years of development. Delivering AI systems at this scale that works well in massive open world games is only becoming increasingly more difficult as games continue to increase in scale, hence it's vital for the game development community that these good practices are shared with the wider world, such that we can learn from one another. Plus, it's fun to learn about how games work and to appreciate the efforts of those who work so hard to bring you giant mechanical tyrannosaurs you can fight while riding on robotic horseback. I mean, how cool is that? Thanks for watching this case study series on the AI of Horizon Zero Dawn here on AI and Games. Hope you found it interesting and can either put this knowledge to use in your own games or just found it fun. Horizon Zero Dawn was one of the most voted for topics by patrons by my supporters over on Patreon. By supporting my work, you can watch these videos early, get updates on future content, decide what topics are covered next and other behind the scenes insights. Thanks once again to all my Patreon supporters with a special shout out to Logan Stallmaker, Joey DiGiorgio, Samuel Kendall, Weisinger, Weisinger, I think, and Chris Evers. Next month is the five year anniversary of my launching AI in games, and I'm celebrating with something special. Late last year, I was invited to a AAA studio here in the UK and spent a day hanging out with the gameplay programmers of our recent 2018 release and interviewed them for hours talking about all of the AI in their game. I've got so much to talk about, I can't wait to share it with you. I'm super excited, and I hope you are too. I'll see you then.